So uh, without further ado, here is Dr. Ken Griffin, um, who uh, is the collections manager of the Egypt Center at Swansea University. And over the past two, two decades of working there, he has been researching the collection, including publishing a number of the objects. Uh, and here he's going to talk about one of those objects with a talk on uh, the princess who never became king, a relief of Princess Neferure in the Egypt Center. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, and thank you very much for organizing this day, which has been really fantastic so far. And I'm looking forward to hearing the remaining talks coming up. Uh, later on today. Uh, so the talk that I'm going to be presenting about is on a relief in the Egypt Centre, which was only kind of rediscovered uh, just a few years ago. A little bit of a brief introduction to this. Uh, it was only really discovered through a handling session which I conducted with a group of students at Swansea University when I was teaching as a lecturer in Egyptology there just over two years ago now for a module on the uh, um, Egyptian art and architecture. During this course, I wanted to make it as interactive as possible. So because of my long-standing association with the Egypt Center, uh, I was doing weekly handling sessions in which we would have four or five people, uh, pieces from each week that we were looking at. Uh, so for example, in the Middle Kingdom week, I requested this object that you see on the screen on the right-hand side. Before this point, I'd only ever seen a black and white photograph of it, the one that you see on the screen. So I didn't know much about it. The Egypt Centre catalogue was quite vague. It says that it was possibly a relief dating to the Middle Kingdom. That was it. The photograph that I had, this black and white one, actually came from the collection of Anthony Donoghue, who was mentioned earlier in, Aiden, in Ian's talk uh, relating to Bolton Museum. And after Anthony had died, uh, I managed to rescue quite a lot of the possessions, much of which related to the Egypt Center collection, since he was very closely involved in the research. So what I'm presenting today is very much a collaboration between uh, the Egypt Center and the Department of Classics, Ancient History and Egyptology, and really shows the benefits of object-centered learning for students uh, and the ability to really look at objects in close detail. I say that the relief is uh, depicting Neferu Ray. For those of you who may not know who that is, I'm very glad that Campbell is actually going to be talking about Senenmut a little bit later, which means that I don't have to go into Senenmut in any great detail. But uh, Neferu Ray was the daughter of Hatshepsut, the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and one of the few female pharaohs of Egyptian history. Many of you will be familiar uh, with her, particular from her mortuary temple that you see on the right-hand side from Deir el-Bahri, this three-tiered monument, which is really unique to Egyptian architecture. And Hatshepsut was a female pharaoh around about 1460 or so BC. Now, even from the black and white photograph, I was quite intrigued by the, the carving that you could see from it, which very much resembled what you had at Hatshepsut's temple at Deir el-Bahri, but also from the neighboring temple over here of uh, um, Nebhetabre Montehotep II. So I was already quite curious as to see whether, stylistically looking at it in detail, whether it could be from one of these two sites. And some of you may have seen that shortly after we had the handling session, it made uh, international news uh, when Swansea University released a press statement through the Egypt Centre to say that a rare uh, piece of artwork in the Egypt Centre collection depicting Hatshepsut had been identified. At the time, uh, this was around about a week or so just after the handling session, before I'd had a, a good chance to research the relief in detail. And my initial thought that, that, that it was Hatshepsut. However, as I'll explain today, there are reasons to show that it's actually Neferu Ray rather than her mother, Hatshepsut. Little bit of a brief history on the collection. Uh, we know that W1376, uh, as it's numbered, arrived in Swansea in 1971 from the collection of the pharmaceutical engineer, Sir Henry Solomon Welcome, who you can see on the right-hand side with his very large uh, moustache, uh, 
which a lot of people would be quite impressed with nowadays. The relief itself is decorated uh, kind of on two sides. As you can see, the upper piece here has the head of a man with a short beard. And I'll come back to that in more detail a little bit later, but the fact that it is carved on the back is quite interesting at the same time. In terms of looking at the relief, and first of all, looking at the front face, as I'll call it here, what approaches can we take in order to analyze this piece and to understand it better? Well, we can look at it from an iconographical point of view and the imagery that is depicted on here. We can also look at it from a textual point of view, despite the fact that there's only a limited number of hieroglyphs that are present. In fact, as you'll see, those hieroglyphs are quite fundamental in helping to determine who this person is. We could also look at it from a geological point of view uh, by examining the limestone, which is being used here, and see how it compares to other monuments in Egypt. Unfortunately, this is an aspect that we haven't been able to do, uh, but I will be mentioning a little bit later. And then there's the collection history. Who collected it before Henry Welcome? And might that give us clues as to where this piece was originally coming from? So first of all, looking at any identifying features that we might have on this piece from an iconographical point of view. The first thing that's really noticeable is the seshed headband that this figure wears. You can see on the, the band on the head with an entwined ureris uh, going through the actual band itself. What this would have been is a, a piece of textile, uh, not quite as long as the one that Ashley talked about earlier, which was tied at the back with two streamers coming down, uh, as you can see with this example uh, on the right hand side, uh, which is uh, contemporary in terms of its date. You do also find examples of these made out of uh, metal. So for example, this is one which is currently on loan at the British Museum, or at least it was just a few years ago, uh, dating to the 17th dynasty. It's a very rare example of one that has survived in terms of uh, being made out of jewelry. And this is made entirely out of silver. If you look very closely, you can see that it's been done uh, so that you have the streamers coming down and the Egyptians, the craftsmen, have really made a fantastic job at producing this to show the, uh, the how it's been tied uh, together or how it replicates how it would have been tied together. And if you look at the front, you can see the double ureris. So the Seshed headband is the thing that really jumps out uh, uh, straight away. What we also have is the wig, which is being worn uh, by the person, which is often referred to as being an ibis wig. An ibis wig is quite common throughout Egyptian history. It first occurs during the Old Kingdom and continues right through into the Roman period, uh, as you can see with this hieroglyph uh, right in the center, uh, which is from Dendera. Now keep in mind that this is just a hieroglyph, which is only a few centimeters high. So the details of the echelon uh, uh, wig, the curls that you've got here, has not been uh, added to this particular hieroglyph. But even if we look at it over here from this image of Hatshepsut from the Red Chapel, you can see that it's very similar to the one that we have on the left-hand side in Swansea. Another important uh, uh, feature to look at is right behind the head of the figure, we have traces of this fan. Now, because it's damaged, we don't know who is holding the fan, but based on parallels, it's probably a personified ank as we can see with the representation in the center, along with this line drawing uh, from Nabil's uh, publication at Deir el Bahri. Uh, some of you who attended the session, the EES session last night, will have uh, uh, heard a lot of discussion about the photograph of uh, Nabil standing on top of the monument. And I should point out that uh, the personified Ankh is a subject which is currently under study uh, by uh, a uh, very dear friend, Egyptian friend of mine, ah Ahmed Hamdan, who is joining us today. Uh, but this personified Ankh itself is quite important, or at least the, the fan which the personified Ankh is likely holding. Looking directly above that, and you have to look quite close, uh, you'll see that there's just traces of three feathers, one here, two, 
and then a third one just coming along. Just the tips of feathers. Now I say here that it's a winged vulture, but in reality, it could also be a winged hawk or falcon uh, taking the form of the god Horus. In this case, when it's, uh, when it's the vulture, it's identifying as the, uh, the goddess Nekbet. But the one that we have uh, in this instance is probably a falcon that we have represented uh, hovering above uh, the king in this case. So from an iconographical point of view, if we add this winged vulture or hawk, uh, if we add the, uh, the seshed headband, the ibis wig, and the, uh, the feather, which is directly behind the, the person, what we have is someone of royalty. So from an iconographical point of view, we have a royal person. There's just no doubt about that. All of this fits in stylistically with what we have from other periods and also contemporary periods. And then we move on to the inscription, which is very basic, not so much there, but enough to help us to narrow down who this person could potentially be. I have the original uh, piece, which is in Swansea on the left-hand side, along with the same photograph that I showed you in the last slide, uh, which is quite similar. And you can see the hieroglyphs are generally the same, with one important exception. And that is the horned viper, which we have in this inscription, is replaced by the door bolt. Those of you that know Egyptian hieroglyphs will know how, quite, how significant this change is because this is the suffix pronoun. In this case, on the right-hand side, the suffix pronoun F means his, the suffix pronoun S means hers. So what we now have is someone of royalty who can be identified as a female figure. Putting this together, I assume that naturally it would be Hatshepsut, particularly if you look at the limestone itself, if you look at the carving, it very much fits in with what you're getting from Hatshepsut's temple at Deir el-Bahri. And in terms of the inscription itself, it's quite basic, but it's also quite formulaic. So it's easy to reconstruct based on parallels from Deir el-Bahri and other neighboring sites. Uh, in the Theban region and, uh, and elsewhere. And it simply just reads as giving all life, stability and dominion, her heart being rejoiced forever, uh, like Ray, forever. And importantly, her heart, i.e. identifying that we have a female uh, a member of the royal family present on the relief. And it is, like I say, a very formulaic scene, uh, as well as text that you have directly above the head uh, of uh, the king, but also the queen. As you can see in this drawing, which comes from the, uh, the Netri Menu, the monument of Tutmosis II, which many of you will recently have seen reconstructed in the Open Air Museum at Karnak. Uh, fabulous work that has been done by the French Center at, at Karnak. What we have here is a representation of the king Tutmosis II, uh, who is presenting an offering before uh, the figure of Amun-Re, just the crown of which is preserved. You can see from the inscription, we have the exact same text. You've even just got the wings of the vulture or falcon directly above, while behind the king, you have the queen. In this case, none other than Hatshepsut herself. You can see from the inscription, the F has been replaced by the S, uh, uh, indicating that she is female. What I shall also point out, and probably added at a slightly later date, is you have this representation of Neferu Re, their daughter, which has been added in here. She doesn't have the same formulaic inscription uh, directly above her head, probably because there's just no space for it in this instance. But is there anything else that might indicate who this person is? And this is something that I initially missed when I was going through it with the class just over two years ago. So when the, uh, the article came out by the BBC and elsewhere to say that it was Hatshepsut, this was before I had uh, uh, already changed the name from Hatshepsut to Neferu Ray. There is an important feature which is very difficult to see. 
and that's the erased modius, which you have directly on top of the head. You can just about see the outline coming along here, perhaps slightly better in the drawing that you see in the center. Uh, these beautiful drawings that were produced by, uh, at the time, a PhD student in Swansea, uh, now Dr. Uh, Felicitas Weber. Uh, so thank you very much to her for producing these beautiful drawings. The Modius as a piece of um, iconography is associated in particular with the God's Wife of Amun. So you can see this very famous uh, statue of uh, Amenerdir I, which is now on display in the Cairo Museum on the right hand side, made out of, uh, of alabaster. And it's usually just on top of the head, uh, represented on top of the head of one of these uh, priestesses. And although Hatshepsut can be shown with the Modius, there are reasons to assume that what we have here is Neferu Re were in the Modius. And particularly if we look at the reliefs that we have at Deir el Bahri, Hatshepsut's temple, there's at least eight representations of Neferu Re depicted at the site. At this time, she was the god's wife of Amun, and this is vitally important to understand. Hatshepsut initially had the title of the god's wife of Amun, but when the temple of Deir el Bahri was being constructed, she had already given up her title of god's wife of Amun, uh, passed it on to her daughter Neferu Re, because she was now identified as the ruler of Egypt. So at no stage, as far as I'm aware, at Deir el Bahri is Hatshepsut shown wearing the modius on her head. Neferu Re, on the other hand, is shown wearing the modius on her head. Uh, this is a relief from the cult chapel right at the very back, which has recently been opened to the public, and a close up of it in which you can see Neferu Re wearing the same uh, Ibis uh, um, wig. She has the diadem with the cobra, which is snaking through here, and she also has the modius on top of her head. What I should have pointed out earlier, and I forgot to, is that if you look at the treatment of the eye, uh, particularly the long cosmetic line and the long eyebrow, this is very much a stylistic trait that you have during the reign of uh, Tutmosis II and Hatshepsut. So this also helps to date it uh, to this particular time period. And later on, Campbell will be talking about uh, Senenmut, uh, who was the tutor of Neferu Re, who's depicted uh, directly in front of her. So I won't discuss um, uh, him any further. Like I say, there's eight reliefs originally, at least, of uh, Neferu Re that are at Deir el Bahri. This one that you see uh, superimposed on top of the relief uh, was in the discussion that the EES had several weeks ago, looking at the, uh, the collections in Scotland. Uh, this is now in the Dundee Museum, and it was presented on uh, by Dan several weeks ago. You can see where it originally fitted. Uh, you have a relief of the king accompanied by Neferu Ray. This is a drawing that was made by uh, Rossellini uh, back in the 1800s, and you can see that she is shown with the modius with the uh, the seshed headband along with the uh, the ibis wig the only additional thing that she has here quite interestingly is the side lock of youth which she's usually shown wearing uh, in her statuary so what about the reliefs of neferu ray at Deir el bahri and why do i think that it's neferu ray rather than hatshepsut why do i think that it comes from uh, Deir el Bahri, rather than, let's say, the Netri menu at Karnak. And it's important to look at the other six remaining reliefs of Neferu Re, which are outside in the courtyard of the temple. This is a line drawing showing uh, the right hand, so the northern door jam leading to the sanctuary itself, in which you have Neferu Re depicted uh, holding the, uh, the regalia often associated with the God's wife of Amun, the title which she had at this time. However, it seems that towards the end of Hatshepsut's reign, probably around about year 16 to 18, the reliefs of Neferu Re in the courtyard were amended. They were changed so that stylistically, 
as well as from an inscriptional point of view, they no longer represent Neferu Re, but have been changed to Hatshepsut's mother, in this case, Akmose, or her father, Tutmosis I. So you can clearly see the difference with this new drawing that has been made, and this is an image of how it looks like today. But if you look at it very closely, you can see the changes that have been made. The Modius has been completely erased because Akmose never had the title of God's Wife of Amun, and so it didn't fit in with her iconography. Her Ibis headcloth, or her Ibis wig, has been changed instead to a vulture wig, which you can clearly see here, and you'll see better in the next image coming up. So here's another example that we have in the Brooklyn Museum, uh, which fits directly onto the door jam on the opposite side, the southern side, and you can really see the, uh, the echelon curls, which have been amended and changed into the vulture cap. So the six reliefs of Neferu Ray were changed and modified, and certainly this is the case that we have with the Swansea piece, where the wig wasn't changed, but certainly the modius was erased. And the erasure of the modius is quite important uh, for identifying it as being Neferu Ray. There are no reliefs of Neferu Ray or even Hatshepsut were in the modius, or originally were in the modius, from the Neturi Menu, which was later erased. Now, um, the director of the uh, Daryl uh, Bahri project, uh, Professor Savrinsky, uh, wrote an article several years ago on King Neferu Ray, in which he argued that Hatshepsut was grooming Neferu Ray to be her successor, starting a female line of succession. Whether she died late in the reign of Hatshepsut's reign is difficult to know for sure. She certainly seems to disappear at this point, and the images of Neferu Ray are changed to those of her parents, perhaps indicating that Hatshepsut is now trying to uh, put more weight on her ancestry uh, as, as her means for ruling Egypt. But we have the relief that is on the back. Now, the interesting story about this is that the relief that we have here, along with three or four other objects, were chosen for the, the one hour session with the students. But we didn't even look at the other objects. We were so fascinated with this. We were making a discovery during the class. This was all in, in, totally new. The first time I seen this relief in person was the same time that the students had seen it. So it was just amazing, not just for me, but also for the students. In fact, it wasn't until after the students had left that I lifted up the piece and realized that it was carved on the back. So we totally missed this during the session because we were so engrossed with what we had on the front. As you can see, the upper half is carved with an image of a bearded figure, which of course doesn't fit in with Hatshepsut or Neferu Ray. And you can see from the bottom piece that it has been cut out from the wall. Important to note here is that the bottom piece is around about five centimeters thick, whereas the top piece is around about four centimeters thick. So it seems to me that they were originally one piece, uh, as we have on the front here, and it was perhaps a larger block, which was later sold or auctioned off, we don't know for sure, and that whoever owned it at that point had decided because the face was missing that they would cut off this upper part and in turn losing whichever decoration that we had here so that they could flip it over and add a new head to the relief and that's why the upper half is around about a centimeter or so thinner than what we have for the bottom piece uh, so perhaps this is how the collector or the, the person who sold it had originally intended the display to look, perhaps to make more money out of it. Of course, from an iconographical point of view, this doesn't fit in, in terms of the short beard that we have here, uh, which isn't very uh, royal-like, and uh, it seems that the person who was producing this wouldn't have known uh, the difference. In terms of the collection history, it can perhaps be traced back to the, uh, to the collection of Robert de Rastafiel, who many of you who are attending the Egypt Center lectures will be familiar with uh, over the last month or so. Uh, for lot number 53, which was purchased by Welcome, or purchased by uh, Welcome's um, uh, agent at the time called Llewellyn, 
uh, says two other fragments uh, similar, a head of a man, a uh, figure of a priestess holding a sistrum from Deir el Bahri. This could be the head of the man uh, which we have in Swansea, although it's difficult to know for sure. As to where it originally belonged to Deir el Bahri, well, those of you that have been to the third tier will know that there are many heads uh, that are missing from the reliefs. This is the lower register of scenes in which you can see these three figures are all missing their heads. If you look even higher up this top register, you can see that we just have the feet that have been preserved. So it could be from anywhere in this open courtyard. What can we conclude from this relief? Well, from a geological point of view, although it hasn't been analyzed, the limestone itself looks very similar to the limestone that you're getting from Deir el Bahri, which uh, Professor Safrinsky refers to as a Hatshepsut type limestone. It is a particular type uh, that is found within the temple. The text clearly identifies that we have a female figure and the iconography identifies that we have a royal person. The erasure of the modius, uh, which is rare and only found at Deir el Bahri uh, when we're dealing with the reliefs of, ne uh, of uh, Neferu Re and Hatshepsut, it certainly seems to indicate that it must be Neferu Re rather than Hatshepsut herself. And what are the benefits of object centered learning? Well, the Egypt Centre is very keen on promoting object centered learning as a way of engaging with students. And that's one of the, the real attractions of having Egyptology at Swansea and people coming to, uh, to Swansea to study Egyptology is the accessibility of the Egypt Centre collection. We want to make it as accessible as possible. And you can really see that from the quote on the right hand side by Jamie Burns, who at the time was a second year student. He's now an MA student. Uh, and you can see that the impact that that had on him uh, from the handling session. It's something that he will remember, he says, for the rest of his, his, his life, really, his, his, his studying, uh, um, his academic background, really, uh, the chance to work close and to see this discovery uh, happening during the class. So I'd like to finish just by thank, thanking the Polish Egyptian mission at Deir el Bakri for their help in this. Uh, they are looking at the temple for places where the relief itself may come from. And I should point out that we have two other reliefs from Deir el Bahri, one certainly coming from Hatshepsut's temple, the other one likely from Hatshepsut's temple, although it's difficult to say for sure. Uh, from the welcome collection, Trudy, uh, Trudy Zimmerman for her help in checking the archives, Felicitas Weber for the drawings, and importantly to the students of CLE 220. Without this handling session, perhaps the discovery wouldn't have been made uh, for some time to come. And uh, I'm sure many of you will have seen this slide before. This is just a reminder that if you do uh, have any spare cash, do think about supporting the Egypt Center Fund. Also think about supporting the EES Fund and the other museums that are presenting today, because we are all struggling with the institutions being closed at present and we're trying to do as much as possible online as possible so thank you very much i hope you are all convinced that it is neferu ray and uh if you have any questions i don't think there's much time to answer them now but uh, i have left my twitter details here i'll be happy to answer for that thank you perfect thank you so much ken um and i think that uh i certainly am convinced that it's Neferu Ray. Thank you. <laughs> um, we uh, are pretty much out of time, but I thought we could maybe uh, just ask uh, one of the questions. Um, so Sonia has asked, how were the relief blocks cut apart for the uh, sale purposes? Do we have evidence of the tools likely to have been used? And so uh, show that it is definitely recent. Uh, what we don't have is the tools that were used in this case, but what I should should have pointed out and perhaps you've posted it already into the uh, into the chat that I did publish an article on this for the Polish Archaeological Mediterranean Journal in which I do discuss the uh, the various cut marks that you have on the relief and you can really see the difference between the modern saw marks and the ancient uh, tool marks that were used on this relief. So you can see how it would have been done. Uh, in terms of cutting it off from the back, they certainly seem to have been using a kind of um, 
uh, a saw which they could get in behind in order to cut the reliefs off. And you can see this in many tombs today uh, where you've just got the piece that has been cut off like that. Perfect. Yeah, so do uh, read the article that I shared the link up in the chat. The um, link is for the whole journal, by the way, but okay. you've got a full journal uh, that you can wow. download. There. Yeah, it's uh, extra there. Yep. Um, okay, so if your question was unanswered, please do pop it on social media, um, tag Ken in it, and use the hashtag collections from home, and uh, Ken will do his best to answer that at some point. 